Hi guys, Mr. Hill back in my laboratory again, ready for another science lesson. We're looking at sound now. So we've moved on from materials and their properties. We'll come back to some of the properties of materials as we move through this unit. We're gonna focus on sound and there's lots of questions that we can answer. What is it? What is a sound? How is it made? How do we hear it? Can we stop it? So can we stop a sound being made? How can we change it? How can we change a sound? Can we measure it? So before we get started with our lesson, our learning objective today, can I explain how sounds are made and how we hear them? So we're gonna start right at the beginning with this, how we make a sound and what happens between the sound being made, it coming through the air, and us hearing it using our ears. Now, some of this you might already know, but there's gonna be our vocabulary as we go through, the names of the various parts of the ear, and there's going to be the scientific names for the things that we're going to come across. So, to start understanding how sound is made, try this. Place your hand on your throat. So you can either do it here or here, or round under, just gently underneath. We're not strangling ourselves. So just gently underneath your chin. Make a humming noise and feel what happens. Can you feel your throat vibrating? That's the sound being produced. So anything that makes a sound is vibrating, whether it's banging on a drum, whether it's humming, whether it's talking, whether it's a dog barking, a cat purring, they're all vibrations. Sometimes it's a big enough vibration that can be felt and even seen. So I don't know whether you've got some big speakers at home. If you turn them up really loud, you'll be able to feel the air being pushed as the, the speaker moves. If we were in school, I'd show you a really nice way of doing it. In fact, you might be able to do this at home. If you've got some clean film and a bowl, what you can do is put the clean film really tight over the bowl and put some rice on top and just tap it with your finger and you should hear a bump, bump, bump noise and you'll be able to see the rice jumping around on top of the clean film, which will show you how the vibration works. And what you can try is banging it a bit harder and seeing how, what happens to the rice and banging it softer and see what happens to the rice. You can also do it with a ruler. Now this one is really annoying, so don't do it for too long. But again, you can change that sound by changing the length of the ruler hanging over the table. You can also see the vibration with this one. It's probably easier to see it with this. Be gentle though, because we don't want to snap our rulers. Sometimes that sound is so tiny, we can't feel it but it's still there because we can hear it. So there might be something that's just a little annoying noise in the background. And you think, what is that noise? Where's it coming from? And it doesn't, it's not big enough for you to be able to identify where it comes from, but you know it's there. So what we need to understand today is how does the sound reach our ears? So sound needs something to travel through. We call it a medium. Usually, this medium is the air, so the air around us. But sound will travel through liquids and solids as well. The object making the sound vibrates. So the force of the vibration makes the particles in the medium vibrate as well. And so we know that the air around us is made up of oxygen and nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and lots of other particles. So my voice, the vibration coming from my throat, comes out through my mouth, makes the air around me vibrate, and it gets picked up by the microphone for my laptop, which I'm recording this lesson for you on. Now, the computer does something similar to what the ear does, and we're going to move on to that shortly. We're just going to have a look at how that sound travels. The vibrations form a sound wave, and this travels in all directions. So my voice as I'm talking, isn't just traveling straight from here, straight to me, the computer. It's traveling all around my laboratory. So if you went and stood behind me back there, you'd be able to hear my voice. If you went and stood right on the other side over there, you'd be able to hear my voice. If you went and stood over there, you'd be able to hear my voice. And the same with over here. 
So sound travels all around us. And if the sound wave is strong enough, it will reach our ears. A nice way to imagine a sound wave is by dropping a pebble into a pond. The waves spread out from the center, gradually getting weaker the further away they go. So if you think that pebble being dropped in is my voice and my laboratory is the puddle, as you get further away from my voice or from the source, me, my, where I'm making my voice come from, the quieter I will sound. But I'm not speaking any quieter. It's the, it gets gradually weaker the further away it gets, which is why sometimes you can hear things from a long way away because there's such a powerful sound when it first begins. Think of a whistle when you go and watch a football match, or when you were able to go and watch a football match, rather. If you've ever been in a big stadium full of people, there's a lot of noise, but you can hear the referee's whistle over everything else. That's how powerful that sound is. So our example, we have a drum and hitting that drum causes the skin of the drum to vibrate. The air particles around the drum skin start to vibrate and we have our wave forming. So here we go, the wave traveling through the air. The vibrating air spreads away from the drum. So the same way as it does when you drop that pebble in the pond. It's not just going to go to the right of our screen, it's going to go all the way around the screen. Finally, your ear picks up the sound wave and your brain translates the sound. So, we've got the sound wave from our drum, it's come through the air and it's arrived at our ear. What happens next? How do we make sense of it? So, here's a diagram of the human ear. And we're going to take a closer look at the various parts and what they do. The pinna. This is the part of the ear that we can see its shape. So it collects the sound waves and guides them in and steers them towards the center. And you can do a really interesting experiment. You can make them bigger. If you put your hands behind your ears like this, and you look a bit silly. But if you're trying to listen to something, just have a try. And because what will happen is the sound waves will come in and they'll get gathered up in here and it'll get guided into your ear. So things will sound louder. So, for example, if you're watching me on this laptop now, what I want you to do, copy me, do that. And I'm not going to talk any louder, but my voice should sound louder because you're collecting more of the sound waves and you're able to hear me better. The auditory canal or the ear canal. So our sound wave has been collected by the pinna and it's now going in. It's coming in through the auditory canal. So sound waves travel along this tube, which is why it's really important we don't put things in there because we can damage what's going on after this has gone through here. So the pinna and the auditory canal are what's referred to as the outer ear. So they're the bits that can be seen on the outside of our bodies. We have the eardrum. So this is a thin piece of tissue stretched like a drum skin. Now, our sound wave came from the drum, so we have a vibration there. What happens next? So the sound waves have been collected by the pinna, they've traveled down the auditory canal, and now the eardrum is beginning to vibrate. It's picking up the sound. The waves are making our eardrums vibrate. So the middle ear, contains the smallest bones in the human body, the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. So that's these bones here. And if you look at the last one, last white mark, just, where's my mouse gone here, you can see why this is called the stirrup, because it looks remarkably like a horse riding stirrup. So we've got our hammer, the first one, the anvil is the next one, and the stirrup, which is there. So when the eardrum vibrates, it causes these bones to knock into each other. So these bones have got other names. They're also known as the malleus, the incus, and the stapes. Best known as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. It'd be slightly easier to remember. But if you can remember those important medical words for the bones in the ear, it's worth writing them down and having them with it. So the hammer is the malleus, the anvil is the incus, and the stay piece is the stirrup. That might be a piece of key vocabulary you might want to write down. If you are going to do that, pause the video 
and write them down. Okay, you've got them written down, let's carry on. We're going to move on. We've got the semicircular canals. So this is the inner ear. This is part of our inner ear, but it doesn't have a lot to do with our hearing. There's a fluid inside that moves around and helps us know which way up we are, which is why if you go spinning around on a roundabout or just stand in the room and spin around on the spot, the fluid in this part of your ear starts sloshing around, which is why when you come off something that's been spinning, you kind of walk and you wobble and you, you're all over the place because this liquid is still swishing around in the canals. It helps us keep our balance, but it can also cause us to feel motion sickness. So I don't know whether you're like me, I can't read if I'm the passenger in a car because I'm sat looking at my book and my eyes are telling my brain that we're still, we're not moving. But the car's moving around, the fluid in the canals is moving around and it tells my brain, no, we are moving. And this confusion is what causes travel sickness. It makes the body think it's being poisoned. And as a result of that, you end up being sick. So the cochlea, looking a bit like a snail shell, the cochlea contains around 15,000 tiny hairs. And these hairs move when they're hit by the sound wave and they send messages along the auditory canal. Now, before I move on, I don't know whether you remember, we did that experiment when we were doing the human body earlier this year. We were talking about how, as we age, parts of our body don't work quite as well as they used to. The cochlea is one of those parts. Those hairs wear away. They can only vibrate so many times before they stop working properly. So we did the experiment where I played a really annoying noise at different pitches and I sat down first because I'm obviously older than you guys, but my ears don't pick up the same frequencies as yours. So it's just part of aging and getting older. And I know some of you were able to hear right the way to the end of the clip and hear everything perfectly. Whereas me, I was really struggling to hear after about two minutes of the sounds being played. But that's because those hairs in my ear I've been exposed to noise, listened to music, I've talked to people. Those hairs have just worn down over time and they don't function the same way they should. So moving on, we have the auditory nerve. So the information from the cochlea is sent along the auditory nerve to the brain. The brain then translates these messages into sounds. So what's happening here? As the wave comes in, it become, gets converted into an electrical signal, which then can travel along the nerves. The brain then translates these messages into sounds. Our brains are incredible. From a sound entering our ear, it takes just 0.05 of a second to make sense of it. To get an idea of how quick that is, if you've got a stopwatch, or you can find one on Google, there's a good one on um, the Google homepage, so if you just search for stopwatch, try and click quick enough on your mouse for 0.05 of a second. That gives you an idea of how quickly that sound travels, gets into your ear, and as you're hearing it as someone talking, or a drum being hit, or a dog barking, or whatever the source of that sound might have been. See so your task for today. What I want you to do is draw a diagram of the human ear. Now, what I would suggest you do, go back to the beginning of me talking you through the parts of the ear. Use the diagram we had, the nice colour one, as your starting point. You could, if you're really gentle and you've got some quite thin paper, if you hold it gently over the screen, you could just roughly outline what you need. And then you could go back over and draw it properly and then you've got it there ready. And then as I go through it, you can work along, pause the video where you need, need to, to add those ideas on and add the correct names for all the parts on. Good luck. Make sure you share your work on Tapestry with me. As always, we'll see you again very soon.